Okay, great. Great. So um, this is the third and final lecture that I'm going to give um, in this series on protein evolution. And I actually made an outline slide for change. Can you hear me? Oops. Now, I'm actually having some issues. Let me just try and fix this. Oops. Okay. Okay, good. All right, sorry. I couldn't get the slides to advance. So I made an outline uh, slide here, which basically covers uh, all three of the lectures. So we had this sort of biology 101 slide. At the start, we talked about some biology and biochemistry. And then last lecture, I moved on gradually to talking about extracting biological information from covariants. Um, and I've talked about protein structure um, at the end of the lecture yesterday. I'm going to say a little bit more about protein structure prediction, um, just to sort of go over some of the things I kind of rushed at the end of yesterday's lecture in a little bit more detail, and also to look at some of the crystal structures that have subsequently been solved. And then I'm going to spend some time talking about uh, predicting or using covariance methods and evolutionary information to predict protein interaction specificity and also uh, to think about ligand protein binding. What I really want to get on to today um, before the end of the lecture is the theoretical analysis of data limitations. So we're in this very sort of exciting era where we have huge amounts of data and we can try and use this data to answer lots of different questions, but we're always going to have a finite amount of data. So you know, we have all of these sequences in the database that we've gathered from lots of different species, but we still don't have sort of unlimited amounts of data. I talked yesterday about inferring the second order terms of a well, POTS model, essentially, from the, from the statistics of the data. And some people ask questions at the end, sort of alluding to the fact that there must be higher order interactions happening in proteins as well. And there clearly are, but at uh, the moment, we don't really have enough data to be able to sort of uh, evaluate these higher order terms in, in a simple way. And so this means we're going to have to try and understand something about data limitations and certainly when can we predict reliably, but also how can we deal with uh, the noise that is present in our data due to finite sampling and due to the fact that samples are not independent. And I want to argue that there's a central role that can be played by the mathematical theory um, of random matrices. And I hope to tell you a little bit about that during this lecture. So this lecture is going to sort of cover the full spectrum in a sense from um, actual empirical results, um, predictions that might be useful for biochemists or biologists, all the way to some quite sort of theoretical work with random matrices. Um, and as ever, if anybody has a question, sorry, uh, it's, it's a little difficult for me to sort of sometimes see when people, if people have questions, but please just interrupt me and I'm more than happy to at least try to answer these questions. So just to recap this idea yesterday that I introduced in the concept, in the context of protein sequence alignments and looking for covariance in these sequences and trying to use that to build a model that can make predictions about the folded functional protein. So this is really a very simple idea. It's an idea that's been popular for many years. This was first sort of tried way back in the 70s. Um, in fact, Peruz had this idea that compensatory mutations, people knew they occurred. They had these examples of compensatory mutations that they'd observed in particular cases. And so the idea that you should be able to look more broadly across sequences was popular for a number of years. And so people tried these sort of analyses. Uh, certainly in the 90s, um, a number of papers were published, uh, but there were sort of problems with being able to actually uh, relate the highly correlated pairs that people found in the data to protein structure and function. Um, but with the sort of inverse 
covariance trick that I showed you yesterday, or that I alluded to yesterday, we're able to recover these results. So this is a different plot to the plot that I showed you yesterday, but this is just showing um, on the x-axis the rank of the high-scoring pairs. So these are the top four, 500 pairs in this particular uh, inverse covariance matrix for this adrenergic beta receptor. And on the y-axis, I'm plotting the minimum distance in crystal structure. So this is how well or how good is this approach at predicting contacts in 3D structure. We really want, you know, a sort of enrichment of points uh, along the very sort of low Y values. That's what we're aiming for. And we have a number of points, as you can see, that are actually quite far apart in structure that receive high covariance scores. And that's sort of, that's interesting, right? You might ask why these pairs receive high covariance scores if they're so far apart in the protein structure. You know, can there really be a statistical signal um, occurring that ref reflects an interaction between these pairs of residues that are far apart in protein structure? Um, the recent work, actually, that's been published uh, from the Baker Lab suggests that, uh, at least in the cases where you have a large amount of sequence data, and where you try very hard to fit these models accurately, but they don't find any, or they don't find evidence for residual pairs that co very, very strongly, but are far apart in structure. But there's a lot of debate about, about that particular question. But nonetheless, for predicting structure, of course, what we want to do is just keep the pairs, uh, the high scoring covariance pairs that are close in structure. And I sort of mentioned this yesterday that for transmembrane proteins, you can do a very nice job of predicting the topology. So call this membrane helical secondary structure. You can take this sequence um, and using a server like the TMM HMM server that I've referenced on the bottom of the slide, you can predict where the different sequence positions will end up relative to the membrane. And that graphic has quite a lot of information in it. In particular, if we were to find that positions four and 70, for example, were a high scoring pair, uh, if we chose to believe this information over the covariance information, chose to believe this uh, topology prediction over the covariance information, we could rule that out. We could say that, well, 4 and 70 can't possibly be close in structure because they're separated by basically the whole width of the membrane. And that's a perfectly reasonable approach to take. And so it means we can define a set of rules where we take the covariance scores and then we add in that membrane topology prediction, and we use it to sort of automatically exclude pairs that don't agree topology prediction. So in this graphic, I'm showing you uh, a set of evolutionary constraints or high-scoring, uh, high, highly covariant pairs that I want to use as distance constraints, but all of the ones that are um, shown in black conflict with the topology prediction. So I'm showing those ones on the right and you can see that even though they're highly covariant, the topology prediction puts them far apart in the membrane. And so we can simply just decide to exclude them, right? We have lots of high-scoring pairs. We're going to exclude these ones that uh, contradict the topology prediction, and we're just going to keep the ones that um, are both highly covariant and also seem plausible according to that, that transforming prediction. And so when we do that, we're able to take all of those gray spots out of the plot. So we do lose some pairs that are close in structure, right? So there are some that are sort of, you know, seven or five actions apart, so small y values that are taken out, but we basically remove almost all the pairs that are far apart in structure through this automated procedure. And that's why the transmembrane structure prediction, those uh, contact map overlays look so clean. We have a sort of extra piece of information that we can take into account. And so uh, this is the BC2 adrenergic receptor predicted contact map that I showed you yesterday. Um, and those approaches, those, those transmembrane topology predictors, basically take into account the physical characters of the, of the amino acids. So, you know, we know that typically hydrophobic amino acids are inside the membrane, um, whereas hydrophobic ones are, are outside, and they're more sophisticated than that, but that's essentially information or the kind of information that they're using. And so um, this is that uh, predicted uh, structure for this B2 adrenergic receptor that I 
I showed you yesterday. Um, and again, these are predictions for proteins which at the time had uh, crystallized 3D structures available. So we're able to check our predictions and confirm that they agreed well with uh, the crystal structure data. And of course, you know, it's reassuring to know your predictions agree well with the available data, but the real test in the sense is to make a prediction for a protein for which there's no uh, homologous crystal structure available, by which I mean there's no uh, crystal structure available for a sequence that's related to the protein that you're interested in. And so uh, for transmembrane proteins, we were able to find a number of families for which no structures have been solved. And one of these was the adiponectin, uh, the first adiponectin receptor. So an adiponectin receptor is a seven transmembrane helix protein. So it has the same topology or related topology to a GPCR. The adrenergic beta receptor that I showed you a minute ago is a sort of classic example of a GPCR. And the adiponectin receptor is also roughly the same size. It's about 400 amino acids or 375 amino acids. Essentially, um, it's the receptor for an essential hormone that's secreted by adipocytes. Um, and this hormone acts as an anti-diabetic. So levels of adiponectin in the blood are decreased under various uh, diseases um, and conditions. And so yeah, it was really kind of interesting it, to, to find out more about this structure and how it works. So we were able to take a large sequence alignment for this family and uh, predict the contact map for this receptor using the approaches that I've described so far. And of course, in this predicted contact map, there is no gray crystal structure data, right? Because we don't have a crystal structure to compare to. Um, but we do see a pattern that's sort of very reminiscent of many of the other proteins we'd looked at reflecting the fact that you have these seven transmembrane helices. And I've marked those in blue on the sort of axes of this plot. So we have this nice predicted contact map, and when we uh, folded up, essentially we found this predicted structure. Um, when we carry out this structure prediction from a set of distance constraints, there, there are sort of many things that can be varied. So essentially among that set of high scoring pairs, um, it's likely that not all of those distance constraints can be satisfied by the same structure. Because we know that typically there are some false positives um, in that set of pairs, in that set of distance constraints, there are some incorrect uh, distance constraints. The, the, the chain can't satisfy all of them. And so um, these uh, distance geometry programs sort of try satisfying as many of the constraints as possible, but you can imagine different constraints get left out in different uh, examples. And so we end up with a, a range of structures. So you, you can generate as many structures as you like. We typically would generate um, a few hundred structures, uh, both changing the number of distance constraints that we include and also um, allowing algorithms to sort of stochastically choose different sets of constraints to satisfy. Um, and so then you have to have a way of sort of ranking your predicted structures and there are lots of features of the structure you might use to do this ranking. Um, and we had a sort of set of heuristics that we looked at, which would do with the quality of the formation of secondary structure subunits um, and other sort of considerations. You know, we had this way of ranking our structures and this was our top ranked predicted structure. Um, and it turned out um, that's the view into the membrane from outside. And you can tell something about the orientation of these proteins in the membrane because there's a charge gradient, essentially, um, across uh, the membrane. And so it turned out once we had this predicted structure, we could compare it to all the structures in the database um, and ask the question, is the predicted 3D structure for this protein similar to any known protein structure? And the answer turned out to be yes turned out to be just four and a half angstroms RMSD from uh, the protein bacteria rhodopsin, which had been crystallized. But curiously, although the structure had that RMSD, actually 
um, our adiponectin receptor prediction was, was flipped in the membrane compared to the GPCR. So it was sort of the other way up than you might expect. Um, so, as I mentioned yesterday, we were, we were able to make these predictions for a number of medically important membrane proteins of unknown structure and, and publish them back in 2012. And since then, uh, some of these proteins have been crystallized, which is nice because it means you can sort of check what you did. It's also kind of nerve wracking because you might be wrong, but at least in the case of this adiponectin receptor, um, our prediction was pretty close to the a solved structure. This solved structure just came out in 2015, so we were 3.7 angstrom C alpha RMSD over 186 residues. And you can clearly see that these predictions are not nearly as good over the loops, the intracellular and extracellular loops. Those are much harder for us to get right for this kind of approach. Um, but the helices are arranged in a way that does match the conformation in the crystal structure. And we also had made a prediction for the mitochondrial complex one, subunit one. And um, again, one of our highest ranked predictions, not our highest ranked as it turned out, but one of the those that was close to the top is uh, three point, again, roughly 3.7 angstrom C alpha RMSD from uh, that solved structure. So this information, sort of evolutionary information that describes the structure of these proteins is buried in those sequences. And we have this sort of hack, if you like, for how to extract it by taking this inverse covariance matrix. Um, so you might expect that there are constraints, you know, now that we've shown this for a single structure, there are constraints that reflect other features of protein structure or function. And one of the first things we sort of looked at was multimerization. So when proteins dimerize or form um, higher order oligomers, there are residues that facilitate uh, that complex formation. Um, and we had sort of noticed that in some of our predicted contact maps, there were these patches of residues that, or patches of high-scoring high pairs, rather, that didn't correspond to um, contacts in the monomeric structure. And when we looked at proteins for which dimers had been crystallized or oligomers had been crystallized, we found that these high-scoring pairs actually corresponded to contacts across that dimer interface. So this is an example. This is an ABC transporter um, in which this was very clean, so it came out very cleanly. Um, and there's another example, I think, on this next slide uh, for the E. coli methionine importer, where a similar situation we had this patch of high scoring pairs that we found corresponded to contacts across the dimer interface. So, of course, again, we wanted to see if we could actually do this for um, proteins for which we didn't have the structure. Uh, and we found for the adiponectin receptor that there were violated sort of strong constraints of highly covariant pairs that didn't correspond to contacts in the monomer, and we were able to use those to predict um, a structure for uh, a potential dimer interface. Um, I don't actually have any information about whether that interface is, is correct or not, uh, but that was the prediction that we made. So it's sort of an interesting idea that you can predict interactions between monomers uh, another sort of interesting area was whether you could capture alternative conformations of the same protein. So if a protein has to change uh, conformation in order to function, you might imagine that constraints reflecting both conformations that are important for the function are present in the sequence record. And uh, we had an example in our set of proteins which we had known structures where we suspected this might be the case. So this is the glycerol 3-phosphate transporter. It's a transmembrane protein uh, in bacteria. This is, is the crystal structure shown here in gray is from E. coli. And essentially, it's a sort of a transporter that works via a rocker switch mechanism. So it's either open to the cytoplasm or open to the periplasm. And so you have a sort of hinge-like motion. There are two quite distinct conformations. And curiously, at the time when we published this paper, 
Uh, one confirmation had been crystallized a number of times, um, and it had taken a number of years for the other confirmation to be crystallized. So somehow it seems that one confirmation was easier to capture in a crystal structure than the other. And our predicted structure was some sort of funny average between these, these two structures. You can see that the purple helices in this diagram are more parallel, if you like, um, whereas the grey ones are kind of splayed out at the bottom, reflecting um, that the, 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 the protein channel is, is open um, in, in one of these confirmations. Um, and when we looked carefully at our prediction of contact map, we sort of could find these highly constrained pairs that weren't close in that particular contact map. They kind of are sort of spilling off the end of um, a helix-helix contact. And so this sort of made us ask, well, are those reflecting the other confirmation of that protein? Um, so we were able to sort of pull out two subsets of contacts from this data and, and, and fold up sort of two different versions of this protein. Uh, and essentially, we were able to generate two different structures using these two different subsets of constraints. Um, one of which was open uh, to the cytoplasm, whereas the other one uh, was, was closed to the cytoplasm and more open to the periplasm. So I think the, the green one, which is open to the periplasm, the green structure in this slide uh, is sort of more, perhaps more convincing. Um, the blue structure is, is less sort of clearly uh, open to one side, but um, this sort of encouraged us to think about um, trying to explore conformational flexibility. We had another protein in our data set, one of these proteins for which we didn't have a known structure, and we were able to see a similar pattern in that case. And so sort of hypothesize that maybe this, this has a similar mechanism, essentially, that we have this sort of helix rocking uh, that you often see from these automatically access membrane transporters. Um, so an even better example of this conformational change was provided uh, when people started looking at this sort of analysis for uh, bacterial two-component signal transduction systems. So a lot of people have worked on these systems um, and looked at coevolution between these interaction partners, in part because they have the nice property that uh, histidine kinase and, and response regulators that signal to each other often signal uh, in a one-to-one -one fashion. So a given histidine kinase will interact with um, a single, in many cases, a single response regulator, and that interaction will be specific, highly specific. Um, and those pairs that interact specifically tend to occur in the same operon in the genome. And so that means that you can predict from the genomic structure um, which protein pairs interact specifically with each other. And of course, there are exceptions. There are um, sort of multi-specific histidine kinases, and then there are there are phosphorylea. There are sort of other versions of this system, um, but there are many cases where the signaling is specific. And so you can construct just by looking at the genomic structure of the of, of these proteins. You can construct a large set uh, of cognate pairs. So histidine kinase response regulator pairings and uh, I should mention that in a single bacteria, there could be uh, as many as 100 different histidine kinase response regulated pairs that all signal specifically to one another. So typically, there tend to be sort of 11 pairs or so uh, in a typical species, but you can have many more. So this is sort of an interesting matching problem. And I'll talk about that matching problem a bit more later on, but I just want to talk about the conformational change aspect. So this is a uh, contact map of a histidine kinase response regulator complex that was crystallized uh, from bacteria called Thermotoga. And that's shown in gray. And you can see that there are sort of these, these patches um, that I put circles around in the corners of, of these plots. So these are the interface between the histidine kinase and the response regulators. You can see in the plot there's sort of two squares, 
if you like, the first corresponds to the histidine kinase and the second to the response regulator. And because in this crystal structure, there's sort of a dimer of, of dimers, there's two histidine kinases and two response regulators, there are two possible interfaces between a single histidine kinase and the two uh, response regulators. And so I'm showing these two different uh, interfaces in, in these plots. So what I mean is that this sort of upper rectangle, when I put the circles, uh, they, they, those, are, those are different between these two plots. And so you can see that we're actually capturing information um, about both of those interfaces uh, in, in this plot, which is predicted by taking this large alignment of concatenated cognate pairs. But what's actually interesting is that within the histidine kinase structure, there was a significant patch of high scoring or highly covariant residues that didn't correspond to the, the crystal structure um, or the conformation that had been trapped in the crystal structure. This is interesting because um, of all the histidine kinases that had been crystallized, um, nobody had ever captured the active conformation. So histidine kinase has to autophosphorylate and then pass that phosphoryl group to the response regulator. And it was thought that perhaps there could be a large conformational change involved in that autophosphorylation. And a group from La Jolla were able to show that when they took uh, high scoring pairs uh, identified in that plot on the previous slide and mutated them, they were able to kill the kinase and destroy that autophosphorylation uh, activity. And this suggests that this, this, this large conformational change in which um, these contacts in the circle are actually, or these high scoring pairs actually uh, correspond to contacts is, 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 is extremely important for the protein. So I sort of touched on the idea of trying to predict interaction specificity or trying to think about interaction specificity um, where when we talked about these dimers before but what about interactions between proteins right? can we use this approach where you have co-variation um, between proteins that interact with each other in order to both predict the interaction interface but also then go beyond that and predict which proteins interact with each other well, this is tricky because, I mean, we sort of know at this point that if we calculate covariance from concatenated sequences of protein interaction partners, then we can accurately predict the, the structure of the complex. Right? I showed you these examples with dimers, and quite a, a few groups have published at this point examples where they're able to predict the complexes of, 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 of different proteins that interact with each other by looking at covariance information. But sort of the issue with this analysis is that we need a starting set of known interaction partners so that we can form the concatenated sequence alignment. Right? So if we think about this example with histidine kinases and response regulators, um, we need to be able to form an alignment where we can put together the sequences of proteins that we believe interact. So in this case, it's somewhat simpler because we have this operon structure uh, to help us, but um, more generally, it's not clear that we can, you know, we'll always be able to, to, to use that feature. So um, I was working with um, Deb Wing Green and um, Anne, Anne Flo Bitwell, and we asked this question, can we invent an algorithm that doesn't need a set of known interaction partners? can we sort of overcome that limitation? So essentially, the idea is that we're going to use the same approach that involves evolutionary information to predict interactions between proteins. Um, so we'll take these concatenated alignments. I mean, if we had this data, we'd just take the concatenated alignments and use that sequence data to build a model, to parameterize this model, and then use the model parameters to predict interaction partners. And I'm going to start off thinking about approaching it in that way, as though I have this data, and then ask if I can remove that constraint of needing this large alignment of interaction pairs. So we start by considering 
case of insulin kinases and response regulators. Here the challenge is really to predict within each species which of these proteins interact using this concatenated sequence alignment. And so if we take the approach that I referred to on this previous slide, and we, we build a model, a parameterize this model in the way that I explained yesterday, then we can end up basically evaluating an interaction energy, if you like, for the, each histidine kinase response regulator pairing, each possible pairing within each species. Right? So we're going to build a model from some training data, and then we're going to score all of the possible pairings within each species, and then evaluate you know, which pairings have uh, the lowest energy. So, um, hopefully that's clear. And sort of the, the key idea that made this interesting was the idea that we could iterate this approach. To say we have some set of gold standard pairings that we know, perhaps from experimental data, um, or from genome structure, or from some information source, we can use those to make a concatenated alignment, and we can then measure the correlations between all the pairs of columns in our alignment, and use those to parameterize a model, and then calculate interaction energies for all possible uh, protein pairings, and essentially rank the possible pairings, choose the best possible pairings within each species, and then use that to make a larger alignment. Right? So every time we sort of do this calculation, we can increase the size of our alignment, and in fact, perhaps even change which pairs are in the alignment from that gold standard starting pair. Uh, question? Yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, when you're constructing the training data for, uh, for this particular problem, um, uh, isn't it also necessary to uh, have pairs of proteins which are known to not interact? I mean, so that you sort of have a, you have a base measurement of how strong the couplings are in the case that there is no protein-protein uh, interaction. So I guess we're making an assumption that where we know an interacting pair, so where we have in our gold standard set we have some pair that interacts, we're, I guess, implicitly making the assumption that other possible pairings in that species don't happen. So that histidine kinase response, you know, is, is, is known in our gold standard set to interact with the first response regulator, we're going to assume it doesn't interact with the other response regulators in the species. We don't really make explicit use of that information, though, in the algorithm. I mean, that assumption is there, but we're not explicitly using it. Um, and it's an interesting sort of question if we could make better use of that information to um, sort of really interpret uh, those couplings physically, or to help us interpret those couplings physically. Um, we haven't done that. We didn't need to do that for this, but I think it could be an interesting uh, uh, area to, to, to look at. Um, but here we're just going to take, yeah, go on, please. I, I can't hear, no, sorry. No, I, no, no, I just said thank you. That's all. Oh, I see, all right. Yeah, so basically here we're just going to take the ones that we believe interact, use those to make an initial model, and then we're going to basically uh, calculate that initial model and make predictions for the broader set. So we have you know, some number of histidine kinases and response regulators that are unassigned. We're going to use our model to make predictions for that set and then keep the predictions we're most confident in um, use them to uh, increase the amount of training data and repeat and go round and round this loop. And what's surprising about this is that certainly as we iterate, we improve our ability to predict uh, these pairings accurately. So in this case, for this plot, I've started with 200 known pairings on the x-axis I'm plotting the effective number of pairs in the concatenated alignment. So that's, when I say effective number, I mean those pairs which are uh, some minimum Hamming distance away from the other pairs in the data. So I guess I'm not counting, you know, if I have multiple pairs that are very similar, I'm just counting the pairs that are, in this case, at least 
70% or at most 70% sequence are identical. Um, so we start with 200, we go round and round this loop, and we're able to improve our true positive fraction um, from something like 70% to, I think, something like 85%, something like that. And so that was nice, but of course, we still needed these 200 known pairs, right? That's sort of a, 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 an issue if we don't have that data. Well, that led us to ask, well, what happens if we reduce the number of known pairs that we use at the start of this exercise? And we tried sort of 50 known pairs, and um, we're able to still improve to almost the same true positive rate at the end as if we started with 200. And so then we decided we'd start with just a single known pair in our training data set. And of course, there's not really any information in the training data, at least about covariance. We just have one example. Um, so we didn't really expect this to work. And we were very surprised to find that actually we we're able to do almost as well starting with just one known pair as if we had started with 200. You know, the blue curve sort of almost reaches the green curve once we have iterated enough times. Um, and of course, one, as I said, one known pair is basically no information at all. And so that suggested that we could really um, start with no known pairings. And here I've plotted this slightly differently. So I'm putting the final true positive fraction against the increment size. This is how many pairs we add every time we go around that loop. Um, and it seems as though, you know, we can, even if we add 10 pairs at a time as we go around that loop, and it sort of, it takes a little bit of time to run this program. Not, it's not, not very long, but um, anyway, it seemed that we could still really do pretty well in the end at predicting this pairing. Um, and so we decided that we could try this for some other protein pairs that we knew interacted. And we found that they behaved in, in a very similar way so we were still able to accurately predict 90 or 90 something percent uh, true positives uh, with this approach. Um, the reason it differs between these different proteins is that they have different numbers of possible pairings within each species. So the histidine kinase response regulator is actually a difficult case because you have on average something like 11 pairs per species, whereas for these examples it was closer to five or six pairs per species on average. Um, and what was interesting is we actually could use the statistics, um, as we were going around and around that loop, adding sequences in uh, to our sort of training set, uh, we could use the statistics if we did this many times, were the same sequences always added into the, the training set? What was the replication fraction? And we found that we could use that signal to distinguish between proteins that interact and proteins that don't interact. So there's a, a null model here shown in blue, which is what we would expect if the proteins don't interact, um, when we're sort of scrambling the data, essentially. And so in the case, the third case on the slide, the Baz R Mal K, these are two proteins that don't interact with each other. And um, for those proteins, the replication fraction really matches the null model, um, sort of reflecting the fact that they don't interact. Whereas for the other two cases where the proteins do interact, we have a signal which is quite different. And that's because basically, uh, the same pairs of proteins are either in the sort of, or they get added into the set that we're confidently predicting interact, or they're not added into that set. Whereas for the, the false pair, um, it's really very random whether a single pair is added in or not. Um, and so that distinguishes. And so it turned out that there's actually sort of quite a lot of information buried in this evolutionary sequence record and we're excited about um, extending this analysis to look at eukaryotic proteins where you really don't have that operon structure to help you pair up interaction partners. So, we sort of talked before, I showed you the slide yesterday. Just, just one question, please. Yes. In the previous slide, um, uh -huh. I have no information about those proteins, but is that sudden decrease in probability in the MALG? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Same something about its function, its role in the protein? No, I mean, this is really just telling us, um, do pet, so in this case, the fact that the replication fraction is sort of concentrated at zero and one means that out of all the possible pairings, 
of protein. So all the possible pairings of BAS S with BAS R um, within each species, the same pair pairs tend to be not predicted to interact and also to be predicted to interact. So it's sort of a bimodal distribution essentially. And that's because it's a, it's a reproducible signal. Every time we run the analysis, we get the same outcome um, because these proteins really do interact. Whereas in the third case, that Bazar mal k sort of fake pairing, those proteins don't interact, you can see that there isn't that bimodal signal. So it's, it's really random. Um, every time we run the analysis, different protein pairs are, are, are predicted by the algorithm. So there's, no, there's sort of no real signal there. It's just reflecting um, noise. It's a little bit subtle to explain this plot, um, but we do have a very distinct signal between proteins that interact and proteins that don't. But it's not really capturing anything more about the proteins than this question of whether they interact or not. I don't think it's reflecting anything about um, function. Uh, yeah. Um, so, but, you know, this question of whether we can predict anything about, anything about protein function from covariance analysis, I think, is very interesting. I've said a lot about structure and now about interactions, but I haven't talked about function. Um, I sort of made this assertion yesterday that sequences record the outcome of millions of evolutionary experiments and they're constrained by the requirements of protein structure and function. But function, I think, is, is much more complicated. So it seems as though we should be able to, to, to say something about function using this approach, um, but it seems more complicated than um, the approach uh, to predicting protein structure. And I just wanted to, yesterday I sort of said a little bit about protein dynamics, and here I have a couple of movies that I've taken from a website um, at UCSB, actually. Um, this is looking at hemoglobin, the example that I talked about sensibly for the last couple of days. Um, but basically, really extremely important for protein function. So here, you know, we're sort of watching a conformational change that occurs in this protein. Um, and, you know, the idea of being able to use a sequence record to explain how this works, be able to engineer a protein to, 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 to function in this way, um, or to be able to, to change the function of a protein, I think is, 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 is really very interesting. Um, and I think that this is uh, a question that people have really definitively managed to answer yet. The idea would be able to design a sort of group of amino acids to you know, result in this kind of motion, I think is still uh, beyond our grasp, although people have made interesting progress you know, in, in specific examples. So here you're watching the motion that occurs you know, once, you can see that oxygen molecule once it has been bound by that heme group. Um, I also have another movie on this slide um, which is illustrating perhaps how the motions involved in the opening and closing of a protein called hexokinase. Um, I think there are a lot of important questions that need to be answered about how you could engineer this type of conformational change or motion. And I don't think that we have a good idea about this. I do want to mention um, some work from the Ranganathan lab uh, a few years ago, where they again used protein covariance analysis of large sequence alignments to try and identify groups of residues that control distinct functional properties of proteins. So they published this, this paper uh, where they introduced this idea of protein sectors, and they basically took a, a correlated mutation analysis where they they, they, can, they consider that the covariance matrix itself rather than the inverse, and um, it's a weighted covariance matrix. So they, they weight the covariance by a function of conservation. So they sort of uh, are messing with it slightly, but, but it is the covariance matrix itself rather than the inverse. And they then did a sort of spectral analysis, and they looked at 
the eigenvectors that corresponded to the largest eigenvalues, and they, they sort of make this assertion that they're localized on three groups of residues, which they use to define um, sectors, or they, they, they name corn sectors. And they then carry on, carried out a mutational analysis that found that these sectors each control distinct functional properties of um, the proteases. So I've shown you a structure of a Syrian protease there, and I've uh, used sticks to show the catalytic triads. This is a protein that, that cuts peptide bonds, and um, they have these serum proteases. There are different serum proteases that have different specificities. So they cut different uh, peptide bonds between different pairs of amino acids, essentially. Um, and so this is a, a heat map of the covariance matrix in the bottom right hand corner of this slide. Uh, and in order to find co evolving groups of residues, they looked at the localization of the eigenvectors or the top principal components essentially of this matrix. So I've shown uh, in the, the, the plot on the slide, uh, the second principal component and they plotted against the fourth principal component. If you sort of look at this plot, you'll see there's a central group of residues that basically reflects, um, that's what you'd expect if there was no signal, essentially. And there are some residues that sort of cluster uh, in this plot, and they, they, they use this to identify three different clusters, um, which they call the red, green, and blue sectors. And if you just pull out those residues, you sort of do see these, these, these sort of clusters in the heat map. And what was really surprising is that they showed experimentally that if they mutated residues within the red or the blue sector, then they would either affect the thermal stability of the protein or the catalytic activity of the protein, and depending on which sector the residues were in. So you, this is sort of a very, no, very interesting study. Um, it, it sort of suggests that perhaps there are distinct groups of residues that control distinct functional properties of these proteins. Um, but it seems tricky, I don't know, to sort of um, really push this further and apply it widely to other proteins. It would be really nice if we could you know, apply this to, to many different proteins and pull out lots of different sectors. Um, but uh, exactly how to do this analysis and how to find these groups of co-evolving residues seems um, kind of tricky. But I think it's a very interesting example. So I sort of want to return to this idea that you know we have limited data. So it would be nice to do something about what we can predict reliably and what we can do to address sort of noise due to finite sampling. So when I showed you that example earlier, where we were predicting uh, which proteins interacted or which homologues interacted with each other, uh, you can see that there's a clear dependency on the amount of input data that's available. Right? So here I've added the total number of pairs in the alignment on the x-axis, and you can see that as the alignment size grows, so this is the number of sequence pairs that we're going to predict over, that you know, if we have 10,000 pairs, we can do a much better job than if we have 1,000 or 100 pairs. And likewise, uh, when question. you use these approaches to predicting contacts in proteins, uh, yes? Uh, could you go back to the previous slide? Yeah, of course, yes. Yeah, uh, so uh, how exactly does the false positive fraction scale here? Because uh, again, in your training data, you, you didn't include uh, non-interacting partners. Mm -hmm. So is, is there a good way of estimating the, the false positive fraction and sort of thinking of this curve as some kind of, a, of classific in terms of classification accuracy? Uh, uh -huh. so, so basically, so, I, I mean, I guess uh -huh. usually when, I mean, usually when you see true positive fractions on the y-axis, it's, it's accompanied by a false positive fraction on the x. So I get, yeah, you mean if I was predicting a rock curve? Yeah. Yeah. If I was if I was putting a rock curve, right. um, yeah. So this this this, I guess this isn't quite the same because I'm making a prediction for every single um, pair of my data set, right? And um, within each species, I predict that one pair interacts and that the other pairs don't interact. 
right? And I've sort of, you know, I've, I've taken the data, um, I've taken data for which that's the case. Okay, so I have a number of species for which I believe, to the best of my knowledge, that there's one interacting pair, or each histidine kinase has one interacting partner, right? right? So there's kind of there's a one-to-one -one matching, um, and you know that histidine kinase therefore doesn't interact with all the other response regulators, right? Right. Yeah. So here somehow the final true positive fraction, um, like. I'll show you in a case where I have a rock curve later where I have true positives and false positives um, for a different problem. But somehow for this problem, um, it's not the case that if I make, if I, if I predict more true positives, I also predict more false positives. Like, right. um, it's sort of somehow limited by the total number of species, essentially, and the number of pairs within each species. Um, I'm not explaining this very clearly, but um, the false positives are basically, uh, this is a t true positive fraction, right. so, um, yeah. The other predictions I made that weren't true positives, I guess, were false positives. They kind of sum to a, a constant number here. Sure. Um, yeah, which I agree is sort of different from usual. Um, but, you know, th th there is this clear dependence on the amount of input data. If we have more data and we sort of iterate, you know, for, for longer, we always iterate through all of the data we have available. But if we have more data available, then we do much better. And likewise, when we're predicting contacts for these protein sequence alignments, um, we have more sequences, we typically do better. We're able to do a better job of predicting the contact. So there is a dependence on the amount of data that we have. Whenever we're sort of computing an empirical covariance matrix from a finite sample of data points, we have this issue of noise due to finite sampling. And for protein sequences, we also have another issue, which is that they're related by evolution. So they're a long way from being independent samples. Now, the covariance matrix the, the sample covariance matrix is, in general, sorry, can you, I'm getting some connection issues, is in general the maximum likelihood estimate of the true covariance matrix. But if we don't have IID samples, then we sort of clearly have a big source of noise. And so I want to sort of make the argument that a natural framework to address this first issue, this finite sampling issue, is provided by random matrix theory. I want to show also that you can extend this theory to address the second problem. So we sort of have this natural approach. We want to identify common causes or factors that explain the joint dynamics of p variables. So we're going to consider a data matrix X that contains n samples of p variables, and we want to ask the question which variables interact, right? And so essentially we're trying to estimate the true covariance matrix and we're going to do that by simply constructing a sample covariance matrix, which is basically we take x times x transpose and we normalize by n. This is if our data is, is mean centered. So we have this problem though that the data are highly undersampled. So that means that because we have a sort of finite sampling issue, I, I mean by finite sampling that we're trying to estimate all the numbers in this covariance matrix. So if we have p variables, there's you know, p times p minus 1 over 2 numbers that we're trying to estimate. And so we need a large amount of data to be able to do that. And if we're in a sort of situation where n is on the same order as p, rather than being much larger than p squared, then we're going to have a finite sampling issue. And for proteins, of course, our, our p variables are actually uh, the sequence length so L might be 300, but we actually have sort of L times 20 variables in our covariance matrix, but we have these 20 amino acids at each site, site that we're trying to estimate uh, covariances for. And so even if we have thousands of sequences, we still don't really have what you'd call a lot of data. And in particular, if the data contain multiple covariance signals, and these might include issues such as bias sampling or phylogeny, and we somehow deconvolve those, and they're all going to be obfuscated by this noise due to finite sampling. So what's the effect of noise due to finite sampling? Well, if we consider a case where we have 300 samples of 500 variables that are drawn independently, so this is IID data, then the true covariance matrix is this identity matrix, so as ones on the diagonal and zeros off the diagonal, there's no 
signal here, right? All of the variables are independent. Hello, you still? Lucy, go ahead. We can see you. We can hear you. Oh, okay, good. All right, I, I just can't see you. Okay, good. Okay, you're there. All, All right, right, thanks. Yeah, so the true covariance matrix is this identity matrix. Random matrix theory tells us that although all the eigenvalues should be one, when we actually compute the sample covariance matrix, we're going to get a reasonably broad distribution of eigenvalues. And exactly how broad that distribution is, is given by an equation um, called the Martin Capacitor law, which describes the eigenvalue distribution of the sample covariance matrix of Gaussian IID noise. So this green plot that sort of outlines the blue histogram uh, is that Martin capacitor distribution. And you can see that it has these two limits, lambda minus and lambda plus, and that spread basically depends on how well sampled the data is. So if the data is, is very, if it was really well sampled, we expect these, these two to collapse, so they'd both be equal to one, because the, data, the eigenvalue should be basically a delta function at one. But you know, if we're sort of undersampled, so here N and P are roughly the same size, we have um, this, this broad spread of eigenvalues. And what that corresponds to in our sample covariance matrix is we see large off-diagonal entries, which we might mistake for signaling that are just caused by finite sampling. So we have this tool, um, this, this Marchenko Pasteur law, and I'm going to illustrate this by uh, looking at protein ligand binding briefly. Um, so you know, we've looked at a lot of proteins, a lot of these transmembrane proteins in particular uh, bind ligands. So here I've shown the protein in red and the ligand, which is carosylol, uh, which is a beta blocker, is shown in pink. Um, that was crystallized in that, in that structure of the beta adrenergic receptor. We might want to ask what other ligands bind to the same protein. So you know, as it happens, we, we know a reasonable number of ligands that bind to this protein. If you look at them, you sort of see structural features that are repeated between these ligands. And you might want to take this data and use um, an analysis of the data to predict what other ligands will bind. So you need to somehow characterize these ligands. Uh, for proteins, we used uh, sequences. Um, for these small molecules, people have developed various molecular descriptors, and in particular, uh, chemical fingerprints, as the description I'm going to talk about. So it's a representation of a molecule as a string of bits, zeros and ones. Um, and typically you use a 2D structure, the molecular graph, to generate this string. And the idea is that a specific chemical moiety will give rise to a particular pattern of bits. So if you look carefully at this sort of long bit string, and there are various length molecular descriptors you can use, but 1024 or 2048 are common lengths. You see that there are a few ones in among all of those zeros, and that corresponds to the molecular graph shown on the left-hand side. This is a fingerprint called a Morgan three fingerprint, um, and essentially uh, we construct these fingerprints by starting, sort of centering on each atom, and then considering uh, if you go out sort of one, two, and three bond lengths from this atom, what fragments do you encounter? So okay, for, for a molecule, you'll carry out this procedure for all of the atoms and construct this fingerprint. And what you might ask is what information is contained. Yes, is that a question? Hello. So uh, do you put uh, the ones on those sites where the ligand binds to the receptor or something like that? No, no, no. This is just purely describing the ligand. So there's no information about the receptor in there, so we're just looking at the ligand. It's just a property of this molecular graph. Okay, so, so the, the ones encode a specific type of, uh, like, amino acid or something? Some uh, yeah, well, you could do this for an amino acid, for sure. You could make a fingerprint. It's basically just saying which um, which bonds, uh, which, which which molecular fragments are present. So um, if you, you can see that there, there's sort of these little pieces of the molecule that are illustrated um, underneath, uh, and they get progressively bigger because you're considering larger and larger um, circles, essentially. And you're just asking what fragments exist in this molecule. So I do this for every atom in this molecule, and I just count up all of the fragments, 
and um, convert them into this binary fingerprint. And there's a hashing function involved in uh, going from the fragments to particular locations in the fingerprint, um, which actually is sort of slightly difficult, makes it quite sort of difficult to, to invert this uh, because there are some examples, there are some instances of bit collision where uh, the same bit represents different fragments. Um, but that's sort of a technical issue. But basically, this it gives you a bit string for each molecule in the same way that we have a sequence for each protein. And so you might ask, if I take a set of ligand, ligands and I compute their fingerprints, what does the covariance matrix of these fingerprints tell me? So if I consider a thousand random molecules from Kemble and carry out this procedure, if there are a thousand random molecules and I'd expect there not to be any particularly significant covariance between them, so I should be able to apply this random matrix theory law. And indeed, if I carry, carry that out, I find that I have an observed distribution of eigenvalues that's shown in blue, and it matches that Marchenko-Pasteur law surprisingly well, given that all I tell the Marchenko-Pasteur law is uh, the number of samples that I have, so in this case, a thousand, and the number of variables in each sample. In this case, I think it was a thousand and 24. So um, that's all very well. Basically, what I'm telling you is the spread of the eigenvalues due to noise can be predicted using random matrix theory. But what happens if instead I consider a thousand ligands that all bind to this adrenergic beta receptor? So I now have this idea that these ligands should have something in common because they all bind to the same protein. And indeed, if I carry out that same procedure, and Marchenko Pasteur distribution changes slightly because I don't have a thousand ligands that bind to adrenergic beta receptor. I have fewer. I have maybe a couple of hundred that I know. Um, so the spread is broader of, of noise eigenvalues. But the question is can I just take those modes that are outside of my noise distribution and use them to describe or to build a model that describes binding to this receptor? So essentially, can I? denoise the data, can I remove all of this noise due to finite sampling that's sort of shown to me by the random matrix theory analysis and, and leave um, a model that does a good job of predicting binding. And the way that that corresponds to a model is that if I then have a new ligand, which I compute the fingerprint to, or I can essentially project that fingerprint onto the subspace spanned by these signal modes, and I can say that if the ligand essentially lies in that subspace or is sufficiently close to that subspace, then I'm going to predict it binds to the receptor. And if it doesn't lie in that subspace, then I'm not, I'm going to predict it doesn't bind to the receptor. So of course, I can uh, take any truncation of these modes. I can take the one predicted by Marchenko Pasteur or any other truncation. And so we tried all of these truncations and assessed how well they did at both identifying ligands and also rejecting decoids. And so I have on the x-axis of this plot the number of eigenvectors or modes that I've included, and on the y-axis I have the percent accuracy. Right? So how well I'm doing both at identifying ligands and also rejecting decoids. And so really what I want is a point where these two curves cross. I want the model that does the best job of identifying ligands while also uh, being sort of stringent and rejecting decoids. And what was surprising to us was that the point at which those curves cross is really rather close to that marchenko pasta threshold. And, and you might sort of dispute that. You might say, well, it's not that close. But if I show you the same plot for the, for the, the adenosine receptor, which is a different receptor, which you also have a number of known ligands, you'll see that the point at which they cross is, is very different in terms of the number of modes, but it's still well identified by this marchenko pasta threshold. So we carried this out for all the receptors in Kemble that we could find where we knew 120 ligands that bound, so a fairly large amount of data, and we found that we made this plot of the true positive rate. Hello? Yes? Uh, sorry, I have a question. Can you please repeat the... Yes, please. The, can you please motivate the truncation part? Um, I'm... Oh, uh, yeah. So you mean, um, why am I truncating the number of eigenvectors? Is that, yeah, that's a question, yeah. So, I mean, essentially, I have this hypothesis that those eigenvectors above this Marchenko-Pasteur threshold correspond to signal 
Whereas all of the eigenvectors that are smaller than the threshold are just reflecting noise. And so if I remove those modes from the data, if I, if I clean that noise from the covariance matrix, then I'll have a more accurate uh, estimate, essentially, of the true covariance matrix. And so, uh, so I'm somehow also, it's a little bit subtle, but I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting that the true covariance matrix somehow describes binding to this receptor because I've just taken those ligands that bind to the receptor. Right? So if I had taken totally random ligands, I would expect the true covariance matrix would be the identity matrix. But here I've taken just these ligands that bind a receptor, so I would expect to see covariance between them, and I expect that covariance to describe what, you, what features you require to bind to this receptor. That's why I'm, I'm truncating um, the eigenvectors. And the reason I'm trying all the different truncations is you know, I have this random matrix theory-based hypothesis, and I want to compare it to all the other possibilities. So you can see that if I had included all of the eigenvectors, when in fact I haven't shown you, I've, I've sort of truncated the plot at 300, I could have carried on to 1,000 or however many eigenvectors I have, which will depend on the dimension of the data. But you can see already by 300 modes, uh, this model is much worse, right? So it, it does identify ligands, but it's very, very promiscuous. It does a really bad job of rejecting deep ways. And so that's sort of reflected by this, this rock curve. Um, you can see that there's a, a trade-off, right? As you increase the true positives, you also uh, increase the false positives. But the area under this curve, which is the metric people usually use, is, 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 is pretty good. It's 0.9. So we've managed to build quite an effective model just by looking at covariance. And indeed, if we then look at those first eigenvectors and sort of invert them, we find uh, features that we sort of know reflect binding to these proteins. This was for the adrenergic receptor and this one. Um, so essentially, we sort of showed that removing the noise present in this data set, that's noise due to finite sampling, greatly improved the ability of the resulting model to make accurate predictions. That was fine, but what about the effects of finite sampling in protein sequence data? Um, you have this additional phylogeny issue uh, in the sense that the sequences are related to each other. It's going to make things even worse. What's going on there? And so I sort of made this assertion yesterday that we could, it was the right thing for us to invert the covariance matrix to find these parameters. Um, when I did this sort of hand waving, I'm going to now hopefully provide a more uh, concrete, at least I hope anyway, a more concrete explanation. So I'm asking here, is this really true, right? We sort of had this hypothesis about transitivity. The idea was that, you know, if residues were, there were sort of chains of residues through this protein, and as the residues got further apart, they would still be correlated because they were connected by intermediate residues, and that was why um, I sort of gave this, argue, uh, I gave this argument about transitive correlations obscuring the signal, and I suggested you could get rid of that by inverting the covariance matrix. And I'm sort of, um, I'm not really convinced by this argument because, of course, what we can do is simulate uh, a system. So we can take a contact map and, you know, use it to parameterize a model, essentially put ones where the contacts are, and then we can run a simulation. And it's actually if you do that, if you run the simulation to generate sequences and then compute the covariance matrix, you actually find you can recover the contacts pretty well. And you know you can sort of vary the various parameter values that you use in your simulation, um, but essentially you, you generally do really rather well at recovering uh, the contacts. So I'm finding it hard in my simulation to reproduce the, the sort of the phenomena that I saw in the real data, which is that if I just look at raw covariance, I get um, many false positives. There are a few false positives that I've shown here as blue crosses, but I'm mainly finding the true contacts. Um, and this is in contrast, I mean, I showed you this, this, this sort of toy model of the real data, where if I had just looked at covariance, I would have found all of these confounding um, uh, high scoring pairs that weren't close in structure. So that sort of caused us to ask, what else could cause the signal to be obscured? Of course, you know, we have this data, we have these versions of the protein sequence that come from different species, 
This data contains mutants correlations because the samples are related to each other. They're not IID, they're related by um, a phylogeny. So there are sort of two covariance matrices that we could compute. We could compute uh, the sequence covariance matrix, so the relationship between the rows of this data matrix, and that's what we would use to compute a phylogeny for this data. And then, of course, we have talked a lot about computing this residue covariance matrix. Yes, please. Uh, previous slide, please. Yes? Go to the previous slide. This one? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You talked about uh, uh, contact, uh, contacts. That, uh -huh. the, that the blue crosses tells us about contacts, but yeah, those are those, are, those are not they're, they're sort of next to contacts, but they're not quite contacts. But yeah. So does it tell us about the nature of the contact? Maybe what is interacting with what? Maybe a particular atom interacting with a particular uh, another atom? Maybe in the case of a protein ligand interaction. So this is just this is just within the protein. So I no longer am worrying about the ligands. I've gone back to the case where I'm just thinking about contacts within the protein. But even within the protein, does it tell us about nature of the contact? Maybe salt uh, bridge, uh, salt, uh, maybe dissect. Uh, yeah, that's a, it's a good question. So um, people have done quite a bit of analysis of this question. Um, and certainly, so when I show you this picture, I've taken essentially a small a 20 by 20 submatrix um, where it's 20 by 20 because there are 20 amino acids, and I've condensed it to give me just one number. Right? But if you look at those submatrices before you sort of do that condensing, then people have uh, found that you can see some evidence of patterns that correspond to different types of interactions. Uh, I think that's it's a good question. Um, there are a couple of references I can send you where people have, have done this analysis and tried to find signals, if you like, of different types of interactions. I mean, salt bridges, is, as you said, is, 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 a, is a really good candidate for that. Um, but that information has sort of been reduced by the time I show you. Basically, I take the 20 by 20 submatrices and I calculate a norm to give me just one number for each pair, each, each pair of uh, sequence positions. Um, but that one number came from this 400 uh, numbers in, the, in this matrix. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so, one more. Uh, yeah, sure. Suppose I do a, a, a simulation of, uh, okay, since the contact is between the protein, uh, the atoms in the protein, uh, suppose yes. I do a simulation of a, a protein, maybe protein dynamics and then protein ligand, uh, protein ligand dynamics. Uh, mm -hmm. Can I use this uh, uh, contact map to know? Uh, the nature of, I mean, how the protein, I mean, how the ligand is uh, affecting the protein in terms of uh, its uh, contact. Can I? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't think anybody has shown that you can do that, but I don't think it's, that means that it's not possible. I mean, it just, you're sort of asking, you know, I mean, I guess, can you say something? I mean, can you say something about where they're going to bind just by looking at these covariance um, data? Yeah, yeah. For example, where and how it binds. Yeah, where and how it binds, and maybe the yeah. uh, the type of bond that the that that, that the ligand is disrupting. Mm -hmm. Sort of yeah, something like that. Yeah, I, I think that's 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 a very interesting question, um, but I don't know how to do it. Essentially, I mean, it seems like you should. Especially if you were to consider looking at the protein and ligand together, it seems like you might be able to pull something out. Um, but yeah, I don't know of any of any work that has done that yet. But essentially, we have this problem with phylogeny, and if I include phylogeny in my simulation, then I'm able to very well reproduce this phenomena that the covariance matrix doesn't accurately recover contact. So in the right hand uh, picture here, I've included phylogeny as well as the contacts, because in the left-hand picture, I just have the contacts in my simulation. I don't have any phylogeny. So if phylogeny causes problems, we'd like to be able to control for that, essentially. So to do that, we need to know what covariance is caused by the phylogeny, what confounding signal is caused by this phylogenic structure. So we can start by considering a sort of toy model where we have a perfect tree phylogeny. Right, we're going to consider a founder sequence of P residues, 
which we independently evolve for n mutation steps, and then we uh, duplicate the resulting sequence and then take the two sequences and uh, simulate those evolving for n mutation steps and then duplicate those two sequences and so on and so forth. Right, so we're, we're simulating a tree here which has equal branch lengths, um, and there's an equal number of mutations on each branch, and we're going to uh, consider that it duplicates at every branching event. The branching events, of course, because of the equal branch lengths are occurring at the same time, and so we end up with two to the B sequences, which are related by this phylogenetic tree, and we can then take those sequences and calculate the covariance matrix. And of course, if we calculate the sequence covariance matrix, we see this sort of very regular structure in the, in the data. Um, it's highly structured, and that of course has to have an effect on the eigenvalues of that covariance matrix. So we'd like to know what that effect is. And so we can sort of construct a model, essentially, where we have m mutations per branch, our sequences are length p, and our alphabet is of size q, so we might have q equals 20 amino acids. We're going to start with q equals 2 because it's simpler. And there's this parameter alpha that I'm going to define, which is basically um, sort of the key parameter to understanding this whole system. And that's because the elements of the covariance matrix are given by powers of this parameter alpha. So if I compute the covariance matrix, uh, we have ones on the diagonal. And then if we had just two sequences, we'd have alphas off the diagonal. Um, essentially, uh, the covariance of those two sequences, uh, the true covariance is that parameter alpha. And if you, if you look at this uh, parameter alpha, if we increase m to be really large, so we make the branches really large, then that parameter goes to zero. And that's sort of what you would expect, because if the branches are really long, then the sequences become independent. And so um, that true covariance matrix will become the identity matrix. But if you have shorter branches, then alpha is going to be non-zero, and so you have these off-diagonal entries that reflect uh, the evolutionary history. So that's our true covariance matrix. It has this one alpha, alpha one structure in this very simple example, just two sequences. And so it has eigenvalues that are one plus or minus alpha. Those are the true eigenvalues. We want to know the spectrum of the sample covariance matrix. And it turns out that we can actually compute expected eigenvalue distribution of the sample covariance matrix. To do that, we use a mathematical tool called a Silchus transform. So uh, the Silchus transform, G, uh, is given by this equation. It's a bit like a Fourier transform, um, but it's, it's a transform that basically um, is useful, is used fre very frequently throughout random matrix theory. Um, and essentially, it tells us something about where the eigenvalues are. So where these eigenvalues, lambda, when z equals lambda, essentially you get a, a pole, um, and the Silchus transform is telling us about the locations of these poles. And basically, Marchenko and Pasteur used a sort of PDE-based approach to uh, connect the Silchus transform to the eigenvalue distribution of the true covariance matrix, T, and so these equations provide a connection between T, which is our true, covariance, true eigenvalue distribution, and F, which is a sample eigenvalue distribution. So these equations are difficult to get a good intuition for. I'm not going to try and convey an intuition here. I'm just going to, you know, we have this connection between these distributions T and F, and it turns out that um, in the case of phylogeny, the eigenvalues are discrete. So that means that yeah, the inverse Silchus transform, which we need in order to recover F, so we can we can get F out if we can compute the inverse transform. Um, it's simply reduces to finding the positive imaginary root of a polynomial. And that's good because um, I'm not very good at solving integral equations, but I do know how to find positive roots or the positive imaginary roots of polynomials. Right? So sort of glossed over a lot of theory very quickly, um, but this root finding is not difficult technically, and uh, that means that we can compute these uh, distributions, uh, the sample eigenvalue distribution that we'd expect that's caused by phylogeny. And I can confirm by simulation that my calculation is correct. So the simulation here is shown in blue. These are for trees with different branch lengths, essentially. Um, if I have very long branches, 
then uh, I recover the Martian capacitor, the independent case. But if I have shorter branches, then my distribution starts to look quite different. Um, and so uh, this machinery is allowing me to characterize the effect of phylogeny on the covariance matrix. And I can actually make a nice phase plot. I can find boundaries in, in phase space. I can solve them analytically. Um, and this blue sort of corner where the branches of the tree are really quite short corresponds to where I actually have two spectral bulks that are split. Um, so you can see phylogeny is really having a large effect on the covariance matrix. And it turns out that so I can also... Can I, yeah. Yeah, so you have about 10 minutes, including time for questions. Okay, that sounds good. Um, so I basically explained the theory to you. Um, I explained it for a very simple case. We can carry out the same analysis for deeper trees. And it turns out, surprisingly, that we actually end up with a power law uh, for the eigenvalues. The eigenvalues of the true covariance matrix follow a power law that's caused by phylogeny. And the eigenvalues of the sample covariance matrix we can show also follow a power law. And it's quite nice because it means we can sort of see the effects of phylogeny very quickly just by plotting the eigenvalues on a log-log plot. We can show that they actually um, follow this power law. So this is for simulated data, um, and they obey the prediction that we would make using the phylogeny parameters. Um, if I make the trees more complicated, everything essentially still works out. Um, and what we find is that the theory still works for these more realistic trees where I have different branch lengths. Um, and I, again, I can plot uh, the phase diagram. But I think what's really interesting is what happens when I put both phylogeny and interactions into the simulation. Well, then I find that power law is still obeyed. And in fact, um, if I just had interactions alone, I wouldn't have a power law. I basically would have a, 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 a slope of zero, right? So it, just interactions doesn't cause any, any power law in the data, right? I just have a slope of zero. But once I put the interactions in, I get this, this, this positive, well, uh, this particular slope. And so that suggests that actually um, I could use this to clean the phylogenetic corruption from the sequence covariance matrices. So I know that it's this power law that's caused by phylogeny. If I can uh, control for this power law or remove this power law from the data, then I can recover just the part of the spectrum that corresponds to interactions. So in this simulation case, it will correspond to these sort of small eigenvalues that don't obey the power law. That's what I'd want to keep. And so we can actually do this for real data. We take the covariance matrix of a large alignment of DHFR sequences, this is something like 8,000 sequences, and we compute the eigenvalues. We find that they do indeed obey a power law, as our theory would predict. Um, we can use our theory to extract the sort of phylogenetic parameters um, from this data, but more to the point, we can identify the point which is shown by this purple line in which the spectrum stops obeying the power law, and we can truncate the spectrum to just keep the small eigenvalues. So we're trying to use the theory that we developed to remove the covariance that's caused by phylogeny. And if we do that, it turns out that we can use just the covariance matrix to do a reasonable job of predicting contacts um, for these proteins. So here I'm showing the plot of contact prediction precision um, as a function of the number of modes that are removed. And what's surprising here is that we need to remove the large modes and we keep the small modes. And what I would suggest is that the matrix inversion that I told you before basically has the effect of achieving this um, because uh, when you invert the matrix, you basically invert all of the eigenvalues. So you kind of upweight the small eigenvalues and you downweight the large eigenvalues. Um, and so this provides a sort of alternative explanation for why that matrix inversion uh, was able to uh, improve contact prediction. And I can show this for a number of different proteins. Um, uh, this threshold 
that you would determine by removing the, the phylogenetic corruption uh, tells you the point at which you should uh, truncate your, your eigenvalue spectrum. Um, so, uh, yes, I'm more or less out of time. Thank you very much for listening. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you, Lucy. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I have a question. So, um, so, so in a lot of, um, so, so in your work with uh, looking at uh, covariating residues and, and predicting, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, structure context based on uh, highly covariating residues. Mm -hmm. So, so in a lot of, so for instance, in a lot of, I think tumors and such, you see these gene fusions where. Um, like the gene which encodes protein A and a gene which encodes protein B, they both get uh -huh. used to form a functionally folded protein. So it's basically uh -huh. two, two concatenated amino acid sequences that, that still fold correctly. Uh -huh. so, so given that you know the covariating residues for A and the covariating residues for B, uh, is it uh -huh. possible for you to somehow intelligently reconstruct what the covariating residues for A plus B would be? Um, so, you mean, if you know, if you have the two proteins separately and you analyze them separately, yeah. and so you know the covariance patterns within the proteins, can you say something about how they're likely to form a complex or... Um, well, if, if both A and B, uh, if the genes uh -huh. for A and B fuse and they form one contiguous yeah. amino acid sequence. Sure, yeah. sure. Well, I mean, in a sense, I mean, the genes fuse, right? But the actual proteins are going to, I mean, they become one protein, so one chain, but they will basically have an interface where the, right. sort of the two domains, if you like, are making contacts across the interface. Um, I don't know how you could sort of go about from the two separate protein covariance patterns predicting where that interface might come about. Okay. Um, because I guess what you need in order for this to work is some information about, you know, the covariance between the two protein domains, essentially, yeah. once they've that complex. Um, I guess you could perhaps compare if you had sort of ex species where they were two separate proteins versus species where they were fused um, to make it a single gene, then you could compare perhaps the covariance patterns across those two cases, um, but I think you really need that evolutionary information to, to, to help you out. Uh, yeah, as far as I can, can see. Um, yeah, so uh, a little yeah. bit on the same lines, uh, uh, if you ha there are many groups of proteins, families, which are uh, truncated uh -huh. uh, by evolution, they may be of this different lengths. So, and also mm -hmm. we saw the example of a protein uh, which was hijacked by viruses. Uh, I think, uh -huh. so, and a part of the protein was left and they have different domains. So if you apply uh -huh. your uh, uh, techniques on their predictions, would you have different results or would you have that largely con uh, nicely predicted? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, basically all of the examples I've shown you so far have been these very sort of well-studied protein domains where they're aligned using a hidden Markov model, you know, to a fixed length um, sort of framework. Um, but if you, you have these situations where, you know, maybe like part of a domain is lost or something like this, and then that's clearly going to affect uh, the covariance signal. And dealing with this case is going to be much more, it's more difficult, essentially. Um, yeah. Also, structurally disordered proteins, I think somebody brought up yesterday, those are much more difficult to align in, in this sense. Um, and so there has been some work where people have, have made some progress with this problem, but, but again, it, it's, it's more difficult, essentially. Yeah. Thanks, Lucy. Uh, all this works very well, I think, uh, when you have uh, hundreds and thousands of sequences, the MSA is robust, but at, yeah. the, at the flip side, I think the challenge is when you have a MSA of fewer than 100 sequences, maybe close to 20 or 30, mm -hmm. then the probability of an amino acid residue 
um, like, you know, at a particular site is of the order one or zero, like, uh, you know, you have sure. information, then how do you uh, gather or distill as much information from that situation? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I mean, you know, this, this question, you know, sort of, basically your signal is likely below the noise threshold, right? This is the problem that you have. And the question is, how can you um, massage the data essentially in such a way that you can reveal that signal, even though it's so obfuscated by noise? Um, I would like to think this sort of random matrix theory approach where you can sort of carefully characterize the noise um, could help with that kind of situation. Um, I think, that, as you say, that's, that really is the important question. You know, can we um, extend this analysis to deal with cases where we don't have thousands and thousands of sequences, which are clearly the interesting cases? Um, and, you know, I think this is perhaps a fruitful direction to pursue, but, you know, I, I certainly am a long way from being able to solve that problem. Um, and I don't know if other people have, have better ideas, um, but, yeah, it's, it's important, but as far as I can tell, it's pretty difficult. Yeah. Yes. Hello, Lucy. Um, first, thanks, hey. thanks very much for a very nice presentation. Um, thanks. I have um, one comment and, and one question. So um, sure. my comment concerns um, the, the use of this POTS model for predicting protein-protein interactions up in issue. So the way, you uh -huh. the way you presented this was as if this was an idea that you guys had for the first time and, and developed. Oh, but sure. It is not really accurate, right? So there is a paper going almost 10 years sure. ago where a very, very similar approach is taken. So that would maybe be sort of um, academic etiquette to sort of mention this prior work. Mm -hmm. and, no, no, absolutely. Yeah. And the second is a, is a question um, that I have about this uh, uh -huh. approach for um, using random matrix theory to, to show uh -huh. that um, part of the phylogenetic signal is taken care of by this, this inverse. Do you think that this, uh -huh. um, this also applies to this other model that we developed, which uses a Bayesian network and, and looks at the determinants of the Laplacian of the mutual information uh -huh. matrix? Do you think that the similar thing is happening there, or is there something else going on? Well, I think that's a really interesting question. I think, I mean, the phylogeny, uh, phylogenetic sort of corruption has to be there in the data, right? And the question is whether the, the Bayesian network framework that, that you developed is, is handling that in some sort of subtle way, um, or whether somehow it's just sort of, I don't know, getting around, you know, it, it's doing as well as it can do, but it could do better if you explicitly took care of the phylogenetic signal. I mean, I think that's, 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 that's a really an interesting question. Um, I haven't studied it in the context of that, that Bayesian network framework. I mean, I think it would be interesting. I mean, I guess, do you think that it, it's handling the phylogeny or the phylogenetic corruption in a particular fashion? No, I don't think so, because we know if we do these sort of very ad hoc uh -huh. directions for phylogeny, right, of removing yeah. from the mutual information the sort of average mutual information that residues have with all the other residues in the protein. This clearly yeah. improves predictions quite a bit. Yeah. So, yeah, you mean like this APC or something similar? Yes, like this product yeah. correction. And, yeah. and my understanding um, is in the covariance approach, uh, this, uh -huh. this is also the case, right? If you, if you uh, correct the covariance yes. matrix, then you, it also improves predictions, no? Yeah, you mean using this APC? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I think, um, I, think and this, I mean, I think basically what you're saying about that being a sort of phylogenetic correction, um, I think is, is, is correct. I mean, I think it basically has the uh, effect of sort of somehow almost equalizing uh, yeah, different rows. I, I, I basically think that has the effect of sort of meaning that if you take the top 10% top of um, uh, contacts or sort of predictions for each row or column of the matrix, then, then they would all be sort of equally significant. And that's what the APC is doing. And I think it is via that, that, that mechanism correcting to some extent for phylogeny. Um, but I suspect that you might be able to do better if you handle the the phylogenetic issue more um, directly than just that APC. 
So I've sort of not, um, I'm not making a direct comparison yet here. Um, we're working, I mean, you know, here I've done a very crude thing. I've just truncated the covariance that I believe is, is caused by phylogeny. Um, but we're working on doing something which is more subtle, which involves sort of explicitly like a linear transformation that take, tries to take care of the phylogeny. So you can correct your covariance matrix and then carry out whatever kind of analysis you, you, you sort of please with that corrected covariance matrix. Um, and so in, in the same way, you know, if you're doing the Bayesian network analysis, you could first correct the mutual information matrix um, and then carry out the analysis in the same way as before. And so what we're trying to figure out now is, is the best way of doing that correction. Um, but yeah, your point about the Bayesian network analysis is well taken. I mean, that work that, that, that you published um, many years ago, I thought was still making the prediction, though, of which um, pairs were interacting with each other. Um, I, I, I didn't understand that if it goes further and is able to distinguish between protein pairs that, that you know, sort of interact and don't interact, um, but I, I should go back and read it more carefully. Um, no, no, but that, yeah. okay, uh, we can talk about it offline, but th yeah, yeah, this yeah, can sure. be, that can be quantified by the exact same measure. Yeah, that, that would be really interesting. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so um, I'm uh, Sanjay Jain, and uh, um, hey. uh, yeah, I uh, uh, really learned a lot from your lectures. Um, there's one thing that um, I uh, would like to request. If, um, you know, it was not easy to take down references uh, from your slides. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, from your I should slide. I should populate them with yeah with 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 references and and send send the PDF. Yes, yeah, so that, that, that would be very helpful. Yeah. I mean, for uh, sure. all the three talks, if, uh, you know, for each of the uh, topics uh, covered, if you could, uh, you know, give, uh, give sure. a list of references that one can go back to, and, and, and that would be very helpful. Um, and sure. a specific, uh, more specific question about the random matrix um, results, um, sure. particularly the ones uh, in which you are um, uh, trying to take care of the contamination from phylogeny. Uh, yes. Do you have uh, some results which, um, you know, of uh, predictions that you're making uh, with, uh -huh. uh, you know, uh, before removal of that contamination and after removal of that contamination, uh, you know, uh, wherein one can see that uh, uh, it, it, it has actually made a, a difference, a positive difference? Well, I mean, um, the, 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 the correction or the difference is made um, if you're using raw covariance, you can see from this plot here, right? So if I don't truncate any of the modes, um, then I, I'm basically here in this figure um, at zero, so, um, because I'm removing the large eigenvalues as I move across this plot. And so if I don't truncate any of the modes, then the, the raw covariance really does a very poor job of predicting contacts. Whereas if I move remove these, these large eigenvalues, from that covariance matrix, then I'm really able to greatly improve um, the precision of predicting contacts. Now, of course, um, if you want to compare this to sort of other methods that people have developed, where you know they use the inverse covariance matrix or they use a pseudo likelihood or various other um, approaches, then the, there's sort of you know people add pseudo counters the data. There's quite a lot of other machinery that's folded in. And so making a direct comparison, um, I think it's something that's important to do, but I think it's, it, it, it's, it gets more complicated, basically. Um, but I think this plot already shows, and you know, trypsin is a protein that behaves particularly well, but it shows that by removing these large eigenvalues, it's sort of something like 400 largest eigenvalues you have to remove, we're really able to greatly improve the ability of the raw covariance matrix to predict contacts, um, which is quite surprising. Okay, thank you. So, Thanks. Thank you. One last uh, short question. Uh, please, uh, I want to know uh, how to use uh, the contact map to to make a distinction between different functional properties in a protein. Um, that's a good question. I guess rather than the, the contact map, I would say the the covariance or the predicted contact map, right? So. Um, just 
use the feature application information to make predictions about functionally important. Um, but I, I sort of suggested that, and I haven't really given you any evidence that I know how to do that. Um, uh, so I guess what I'm saying, I think it's a, an interesting area for future research. People have made claims in the literature that they can do this. Um, and solid. Those claims are, I think they're very interesting. Um, and I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done because I think that's a very interesting question to try and answer. It's clear that there's some signal, I think, but it's not really clear yet how to definitively extract it, as far as I can tell. Um, but that's just my opinion. Yeah, so unfortunately what I'm saying is that I can't really answer the question. Okay, please remember to send the material you talked about, please. Yes, yeah. I can send the material about, yeah, the different kinds of contacts and stuff, for sure. So thanks, Lucy, very much. And yeah, thank you. Thanks.